I love that line in the song, clear the stage and make some space for the one who deserves it. That's what uh, this worship service is all about. That's what this church is all about. I'm just so thankful, uh, Alex, for that song. Uh, I'd like you to stand with me, if you would. We're going to read God's Word. We believe that the Word of God is the truth, and we uh, just give messages from the Lord, from His truth. And this morning, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. So if you have a Bible, uh, follow along with me, Luke chapter 12. It says, under these circumstances, after so many thousands of people had gathered together, that they were stepping on one another, he, Jesus, began saying to his disciples, first of all, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. But there is nothing covered up that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Accordingly, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in the inner rooms will be proclaimed upon the housetops. I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that, have no more they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two cents, and yet not one of them is forgotten before God? Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, you are more valuable than many sparrows. And I say to you, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will confess him before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, will not, it will not be forgiven him. When they bring you before the synagogues and rulers and authorities, don't worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, uh, we need the Holy Spirit of truth uh, to visit us this morning to show us the reality and the truth of these verses that we have just read. Lord, we, we desperately need to know the truth. Lord, to know it, to believe it, to adjust our lives to it uh, for your glory and ultimately for our eternal good. And so I pray this morning that your Holy Spirit would speak uniquely to each person here, no matter where they are in their journey with you, Lord, that you would move and prompt them to take a step closer to you today. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory. We pray in that matchless name of the Lord Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Please be seated. Well, it's been uh, several weeks since we have been uh, in the Gospel of Luke. We had a great series, the five guys on the five girls in uh, the Bible. They did a great job. Uh, but we come this morning to Luke chapter 12, which uh, is loaded with truth that prepares us for eternity and gives us uh, what we need to live in the present. It's a, it's a chapter, Luke 12 is, it deals with some huge issues, hypocrisy and worry and materialism all these things we'll be looking at over the next month or so. Uh, look at Luke chapter 12 and verse 1. It starts by saying this, under these circumstances. Uh, Jesus had been invited to lunch at the end of chapter 11 by a Pharisee and a bunch of lawyers, and he basically, at this lunch, unmasks the hypocrisy of false religion. He, he showed them that they were all about outward show, and not inward sincerity. They were, they were about a religion of externals and not the internal matters of the heart. And he, he left them with the thought that true religion is a matter of the heart. And at that uh, lunch, he pronounced six woes over the Pharisees and the lawyers before they even got to dessert. And in the end, the, the Pharisees and the lawyers became incredibly hostile toward Jesus. They were ready to have him for lunch uh, you know, at the next time together. 
And so after this, Jesus leaves this lunch, and it says, again, in Luke 12, verse 1, under these circumstances, after so many thousands of people had gathered together, that they were stepping on one another. There, there is a massive crowd. Uh, the Greek indicates tens of thousands of people. Jesus is kind of at the height of his, his you know, uh, the, the people knowing about him. And people are trying to get close to him. They're stepping on one another, literally. And in this crowd, there are two groups of people. There are the curious and there are the condemning. There, there are those who are here classified as disciples, and it doesn't mean just the 12 disciples that we know. It means uh, a disciple means a learner. It means those people that were interested in knowing more about Jesus and what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. There were, there were a bunch of people in that category. And it says that he began saying to his disciples, to these learners, first of all, here's what he says to them, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. You know, hypocrisy is claiming to be something that you're not. Hypocrisy is claiming to have something that you don't have. And the Pharisees claimed to have truth concerning how to get to heaven. They had built a law-based system that we have described again and again as a performance-based acceptance before God. It was a religion that focused on the outside and how they looked to people on the outside but it left you unchanged on the inside. Uh, you get to heaven by, by measuring up to outward standards. It, it was a religion of what I do and not what Jesus Christ has done. It was law versus grace. And Jesus is saying that the teaching of the Pharisees here is like leaven. You know what leaven is? You take a, a little lump of, uh, of dough, uh, fermented dough, and it sits there in those fermenting juices, and then you put it into a new lump of dough, and then it just it expands and it permeates the new lump. And Jesus is saying here, beware, take heed, protect yourselves from the permeating and fermenting influence of the Pharisees. And, and I will tell you this, folks, that the religion of a performance-based acceptance before God has literally permeated the planet. It is the most basic religion on planet Earth right now. It is Satan's hypocritical and counterfeit religion. And Jesus is saying, save yourselves from the damning influence of apostate religion. Avoid all contact with it. And how does one avoid hypocrisy? That's the question of the morning. And that's the question that Jesus answers in verses 1 through 12. He gives five truths, five antidotes, to avoid hypocrisy. And here comes the first, and we'll just go through them quickly. The truth about secrets, verses 2 and 3. But there is nothing covered up that will not be revealed or and hidden that will not be known. Accordingly, whatever you have said in the dark, folks, this is the truth here, whatever you've said in the dark is going to be heard in the light. Whatever you have whispered in the inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. If I'm going to avoid hypocrisy, I need to understand the truth about secrets. And the reality is this, folks. There are none. There are no secrets in heaven. The reality is that there is a God in heaven from whom no secret can be kept. And more than that, more than that, there is coming a day when all secrets will be revealed. You ever think about this? Think about this. Nothing you have ever done, nothing you've ever said, will not one day be revealed. All of your actions. There's nothing covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be made known. We, we try to hide stuff all the time, uh, things that we've done that we don't want others to know. My wife is a great baker. I mean, she makes incredible cakes. And she will make a cake. This has happened more than once. And I'll have a piece at dinner. She'll go to bed, and it'll be under some aluminum foil. You know how that, that is? And, and so I will sneak you know, to, the, to the cake, and just I mean, you can't even hear me. And I lift it up, I cut another little piece, eat another piece, and I go back to the bedroom, and she says, what have you been doing? 
What do you mean? This? I mean, that's, what, that's the way we try to hide things. But there's coming a day when all hypocrisy will be unmasked. If, if you knew there were no secrets, would that not guard your heart from hypocrisy? There, there's a second great truth that guards the heart from hypocrisy, and that's the truth about fear in verses 4 and 5. Jesus says, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that they have no more that they can do. But I warn you whom to fear, fear the one who after he has killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. J.C. Ryle makes this comment on these verses. Listen, he says, the reality and the fearfulness of hell stand out awfully on the face of this verse. There is, folks, the Bible says it, there is a hell after death. The state of the wicked man after this life is not annihilation, does not just go out of existence. There is a hell which ought to be feared. There is a just God who will finally cast into hell the obstinately impenitent. How many of you have ever heard the expression YOLO? Anybody? Have you? Come on. I, I mean, I heard it the other day. It means you only live once. That, that is biblically inaccurate. Um, direct opposition to scripture, it's, it's biblically correct to say, yolt, you only live twice. <laughs> there, folks, there are two lives that every one of us will live. There's the life right now in time and the life after death and the one after death could be in heaven, it could be in hell. And these verses are teaching us the great truth that there's only one true legitimate cause for fear. And notice as Jesus addresses this to those who would be his followers, those who are, uh, he says, don't be afraid if you're a follower of mine of those who killed the body and after that no more they can do. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ and have been gripped by true religion that is found in Christ alone, you should never fear, fear those who killed the body. And, and, and yet, is it not true that the fear of man is so powerful? I know people that would jump into a ring with a tiger rather than face the laughter of their friends or family for their stand for Jesus Christ. J.C. Ryle says this, consider now the best, here's the best remedy for the fear of man. How are we to overcome these powerful feelings and break the chains that it throws around us there's, there's no remedy like the one that Jesus recommends here. We must supplant the fear of man by a higher and more powerful principle, the fear of God. We must look away from those who can only hurt the body to him who has dominion over the soul. We have to turn our eyes, turn our eyes away from those who can only injure us in this life to him who can condemn us to eternal misery in the life to come. YOLO is heresy, folks. Armed with this mighty principle, Ryle says, we shall not play the coward. Seeing him that is invisible, we shall find the lesser fear melting away before the greater and the weaker before the stronger. In other words, the bigger fear, fear the true fear, is the way to overcome the smaller fear. If you have your Bible there, turn to Revelation 21. And consider this, if you are a true follower of Jesus Christ and someone kills you, they have launched you into the ultimate journey into joy. The Apostle Paul had seen heaven as a man, and he says this in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. It's a journey to joy. It is for the Christian, when we die, we entered the land, I call it the land of no longers. Uh, you say, well, what, what do you mean, the land of no longers? Look at Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4. It says, the Apostle John says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne, the throne in heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be 
among them and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning, no longer any crying, no longer any pain for the first things have passed away. We should not fear those who can only kill the body. But there is one very legitimate cause and reason for fear, and Jesus puts it this way, I warn you, who's the one to fear? You fear the one who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. The Bible talks about a second death. Everybody is going to die once unless we're in the terminal generation and are raptured. But after the first death comes the judgment, and then those who have not turned to Jesus Christ will face the second death. In Revelation 20, 14, it says that death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Revelation 26, verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Uh, over these, the second death has no power. The greatest one to fear, folks, is the one who can send you into the second death, into an everlasting hell. And though, though Jesus, as you read this passage, is speaking in the third person, what he's saying is this, you know, you really need to fear me. <laughs> because it is the Lord Jesus who will one day come back as ju to judge the living and the dead. It is the Lord Jesus who decides who goes to heaven who goes to hell. It is the Lord Jesus who makes the determination of where you will spend eternity. The Father gave him, John 5, 27, authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Fear the Lord. And you know what the Bible says about this kind of fear? Proverbs 1, verse 7 says, the fear of the Lord, that's the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In, in Proverbs 14, 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. You only begin to live when you, you, you start to fear God, that one may avoid the snares of death. There, the, it is absolutely essential in my life. If I'm going to overcome and avoid hypocritical religion, I must know the truth about secrets, the truth about fear. Here's a third thing. I need to know and understand the truth about value. It says in verse 6, Jesus said, Are not five sparrows sold for two cents, and yet not one of them is forgotten before God? Indeed, the very hairs of your head, the very hairs of your head are numbered. Do not fear, you are more valuable than many sparrows. Would you notice here it, it, this fact that there's, there's nothing that escapes the Lord's notice. I mean, the most insignificant sparrow that flits around from this tree to that tree, I mean, he's all over it. Uh, all of the hairs on your head have been counted. I mean, admittedly, not that difficult with me. But he knows every hair on your head. He knows it all. The, this verse teaches the reality that God never learns anything. He already knows it. Are not five sparrows sold for two cents yet? Not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are numbered. And then watch this. Notice what it says next. It says, do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Folks, God cares. I think this says God cares about sparrows. But when it comes to comparing a sparrow and a human life, there is absolutely no comparison. But folks, do you understand that we as a society have come to value birds more than babies? Yesterday, if most recent statistics are correct, there were 1,871 babies aborted in America. But you didn't read about it in the paper. The headline in the Annapolis Capitol, which I have right here, was about a failed attempt to save an osprey that got caught up in fishing wire. Um, right above the fold, I mean, this is, this is the headline in the news. 
And I'm not saying in any way that we should not have compassion on birds. I really am not. But what about the babies? Folks, what about the babies? I mean, this walk for life, we're sharing. Uh, you know, it is so important. What about babies who are made in the image of God, babies who have a soul that is capable of knowing God and a life that is capable of giving glory to God in a way that a bird can't? The Lord has put, you have a treasure right in your heart. The Lord has put the highest worth upon a human soul. There's nothing on this earth as valuable as a man made in the image of God. Look at this next verse, Matthew Chapter 16, verse 26, it says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? I mean, just consider who is the wealthiest man on the planet right now. Maybe the Amazon guy, Jeff Bezos. Or maybe it's, uh, maybe it's the, the Pope and the Catholic Church or the Queen of England. We don't know who it is. But if you were to go to them, the, most, the wealthiest person on the earth, and say, okay, here's the deal. You can, you can have all your stuff or you can have your soul. You either can keep your stuff or give up your soul. I'm telling you, if, if he gives up his soul, he has made a bad deal. Your, your, soul, your soul is worth everything that's on this planet right now. You are of infinite worth and value because you have been made in the image of God. All the accumulated wealth in the world is not what's in the heart of that little baby that was born yesterday somewhere. I am guarded from hypocrisy and my heart is drawn to Jesus when I understand how much he values my heart and my soul. God values my heart more than my stuff, my inside more than my outside. How valuable are you to God? How valuable is your heart to God? The cross tells us, knowing this, you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from your former manner of life, but, but with the, the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Listen, I will be guarded from hypocrisy when I know the truth about secrets, the truth about fear, and the truth about true value. And then number four, the truth about confession, verses 8 through 10. And I say to you, Jesus says here, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will confess him also before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Now confession is simply saying the truth about something. To confess Christ is to confess who he is, who he says he is, that he is Lord that he is God in human flesh. He is the, the Son of God, the Holy One who came and lived a human life without sin. He's the one who died on a Roman cross, was crucified, dead, buried, ascended to the right hand of the Father, and he's the one who's coming back. And what is the, the if we're to confess Christ, what is the scope of our confession to be? Where are we to confess? It says, everyone who confesses me before men. This is saying we must confess Christ here on earth if we expect to be among those who are saved on the last day. We must not be ashamed to let men see that we believe Christ, serve Christ, love Christ, care more for the praise of Christ than the praise of men. I will never forget the first time I had as a Christian to confess Christ. I'd been a Christian for one month. In June of 1972, I was a naval officer, had orders to the Navy Supply School in Athens, Georgia. I checked in there, went to the housing referral office, and some, some cool guy, uh, another officer from UCLA, came in right at the same time. They showed us where some apartments were. I asked, do you want to ride with me? He said, yeah. So go to my car and hopped in the car. My Bible was sitting right between us. He's over there and I'm here. And I was, you know, just a new Christian. I wasn't, you know, I was, I was a cool guy, you know. And, and I wasn't ready to shout from the mountaintops. So he gets in, looks down, and he looks at me. I didn't know where he was coming from. He said, are you a Christian? And, and I mean, pause, gulp. 
remember Jesus. And I said, yes, I am. Uh, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. He said, hey, brother, so am I. <laughs> I just came to, to Christ six months ago out at UCLA in a campus ministry out there. We need to understand, folks, the truth about confession. Jesus promises in verse 8, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man, will confess him before the angels of God. You say, Bill, what does that mean? When does confession, when does Jesus confess you before men, uh, before the angels of God? I, I don't know exactly, but I think it's at the time of the judgment, when we die and go and stand before God, and I think there, all the angels are there, somehow, some way, in eternity. And, and, you know, I just envision this scene that I die and I stand before God, and all these angels are there looking on, and Jesus says, here he is. <laughs> There's, there's Bill McKinney. Uh, he's one of mine. Uh, go ahead and do the ticker tape parade. You know, He's coming in. He's coming home. Um, turn to Revelation 21. There's a promise that is the flip side of this promise. You confess me before men, I'll confess you before the angels in heaven. But here's the flip side. He who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. That's a sobering verse, folks. Our Lord declares here that if we do not confess him before men, he will not confess us before the angels of God on the last day. He will refuse to acknowledge us as his people. He will disown us as cowards, faithless deserters. He will not plead for us. He will not be our advocate. He will not deliver us from the wrath to come. He will leave us to reap the consequence of our cowardice and stand before the bar of God, helpless, defenseless, unforgiven. Now, folks, I'm not saying <laughs> that you never have a failure in your life to speak up, but I'm saying if your life is characterized by... <laughs> Revelation 21, verse 8, says, but for the cowardly, those who will not confess Christ, the unbelieving, the abominable murderers, immoral persons, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars, their part will be in the lake of, that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. What an awful prospect, folks. To get to the very end, can there be anything more horrible to be contemplated than to be told by God that you don't belong here? There are, uh, look at Matthew chapter 25. And verse 31, Here, here's what's going to happen at the end of the age. It says, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, you see, then he will sit on his glorious throne. This is Jesus on the throne, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep on his right hand, the goats on his left, and then the king, Jesus, will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the, from the foundation of the world, before the angels. But down in verse 41, he says, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. I'm going to tell you, this is sobering truth about confession of Christ. Um, the, the, the truth about confession and the consequences of confession or denial will do much to guard your heart from hypocrisy. Confession of Christ is an antidote to hypocrisy. And then finally, uh, the fifth truth, the truth about the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. It says, And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. When they bring you to the synagogues, the rulers, authorities, do not worry about what you're to speak in your defense or what you're to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Two great realities in these verses. Reality number one, the Holy Spirit is blasphemed by those who reject. Everyone who speaks, listen to this, a word against the Son of Man, 
it will be forgiven him. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. Now, this is a verse that has been extremely troublesome for people. Have you ever struggled with this verse? Anybody here? It's a troublesome verse. It's, this is called the unpardonable sin, and it relates to the Holy Spirit. You can speak a word against Jesus, but not against the Holy Spirit. In Mark 3, Mark chapter 3, verse 28 and 29, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, all sin shall be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. You say, Bill, what is he talking about? Why does this one particular sin, this one blasphemy, make it impossible to repent and be forgiven? What, what about the blasphemy of the Son of God, or the Father, or angels, or Scripture, or the church? It can be forgiven. But what about this puts a person beyond repentance and forgiveness? Why only blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? It is because, listen to me carefully now, it is because of the unique and decisive role that the Holy Spirit plays in our salvation. You know, if we look to God the Father and turn away from Him and His glory and embrace sin, that's bad. If we look to the Son of God and we turn away from Him and embrace sin, that's doubly bad. But in either case, there's hope. The Father has planned our redemption the Son has accomplished redemption, and this redemption is outside of ourselves. It's available to us at any point where we uh, repent of sin and turn back to Christ in faith. The, but, but listen to this, and you want to fill this out. It is the unique and special role of the Holy Spirit to apply the Father's plan and the Son's accomplishment of it to our hearts. It's the role of the Holy Spirit to apply the Father's plan and the Son's accomplishment to our hearts. It is the Spirit's work to open our eyes, to grant repentance, to make us beneficiaries of salvation, of all that the Father planned, of all that Christ has done. The Holy Spirit is the one who closes the deal, who gets us to sign on the dotted line. He is the one who, through the preaching of the Word of God, convinces the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. And in the context of Luke 12, it is the Holy Spirit who unmasks the hypocrisy of the unbeliever and leads them to the truth. He is the one who leads us to that place of repentance. He is the one who speaks and turns on the light in our hearts. The Holy Spirit, listen to me, folks, is the voice of God. If you've heard, it is the Holy Spirit who is the voice of God that speaks to our heart, the, the gospel message. He's the one who convicts us that we are lawbreakers, every single one of us, deserving eternal judgment. And then he reveals Jesus. He opens our eyes to Jesus as the one who loved us so much that he went to hell for us so he wouldn't have to live in heaven without us. He reveals Jesus as the one who paid a debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. And he shows us that the way of salvation is through repentance and faith. He speaks to our hearts of the free gift. He says, repent, believe, stop sinning, start following Jesus. And we hear his voice and we either respond to the Spirit's voice or we, we resist. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is brought about by continued, repeated resistance to the voice of the Holy Spirit. That's why it says not once, but twice in the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 7, chapter 4, verse 7, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And let me take one more step before I give you a definition of the unforgivable sin. Some people say that the unpardonable sin is continual rejection of the Holy Spirit and the person of Jesus Christ until death, and thus only death puts a person beyond forgiveness. That, that's wrong for, for a couple of reasons. One is that in Matthew chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus said, whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. 
So if the possibility of forgiveness were taken away only after death, Jesus would not have said the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is unforgivable in this age as well as the one to come. Therefore, the unforgivable blasphemy against the Spirit is not simply a lifetime of resistance against the Holy Spirit. You say, well, well, what is it? I like John Piper's definition. It is this. The unforgivable sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is an act of resistance which belittles the Holy Spirit so grievously that he withdraws forever with his convicting power so that we are never able to repent and be forgiven. Listen to J.C. Ryle define it. He says, The sin to which the Lord refers to in this passage appears to be the sin of deliberately rejecting God's truth with the heart while truth is clearly known with the head. It is the combination of light in the understanding but determined wickedness in the will. When does, it, when does the unpardonable sin occur? It occurs after the Holy Spirit has spoken in a person's life repeatedly, again and again and again. That person may have come up very close to the truth. They may even have become a church member, but, but they refuse to give up their sin and to fully commit their lives to Jesus Christ. God speaks, they say no. God speaks, they say no, no, no. And then all of a sudden, God stops speaking. And the person is moved beyond that place. So if you hear the voice of God and continually harden your heart and do not respond, you can reach a point where your heart, where you can't hear. And the Spirit's ministry is cut off in your life. And that can happen right now in this age. Are there examples in Scripture of those who committed the unpardonable sin? Uh, there are several. Uh, we believe that these Pharisees to whom Jesus was ministering were very close to the unpardonable sin. The people in the days of Noah, Noah preached Jesus for 120 years, and the people said no, 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 they would not repent. And Genesis 6 verse 3 says, My spirit will not always strive with men. Pharaoh in Egypt was one. It says that you look at the plagues and it says Pharaoh hardened his heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart. And about the fifth or sixth plague, it says God hardened his heart. Well, God didn't harden his heart. His heart became so hard that he could not hear God. The heathen in Romans 1 cross a line. They resist God, resist God so that God gives them over. So if you reject the message of the Holy Spirit, you could end up in a place where there's no forgiveness. But what happens when you receive the message, when you hear his voice and you respond? And I'm just going to mention this quickly. Reality number two, the Holy Spirit is a blessing. A blessing to those who receive the word. Don't you wish you had someone to go to, to go with you during your most difficult times of life, someone who could teach you how to live your life in the most difficult circumstances, hold you up in the most difficult times? Don't you wish you had someone who could teach you what to say under pressure, could teach you how to respond in conflict, who could help you uh, when all the world is against you? That, that's who the Holy Spirit is. In verses 11 and 12, when they bring you before the synagogues and the authorities and, and the rulers, don't worry about what you're to speak in your defense or what you're to say, for the Holy Spirit is with you. He will give you the power, the grace to walk in obedience to me. So folks, in closing, you will either be a blasphemer of the Holy Spirit or experience the blessing of the Holy Spirit depending on whether or not you listen to his voice and obey. He has been speaking today, I believe, about how to avoid hypocrisy and false religion. So we finished going over the verses. Just real quickly, how can these things be practical for us today? If all these things are true that Jesus is saying, how can I make it practical? I saw at least five things that ought to stop in our lives if these things are true. Under secrets, listen folks, hear me. If you are hiding anything from God, stop. Stop. Be honest with God. Be honest with one another. 
you, there's help for you if you are honest before God and before other people. There's no help if you're not honest. Under fear, if you are fearing man, stop it. There is a far greater fear that you need to have, and that fear will enable you to conquer the fear of man and will lead you to a life that you never dreamed possible. If you're fearing man, stop it. Value. If you have a low view of your soul or anybody else's soul before God, stop that. You, you have a, an absolute treasure inside of you. Everybody sitting in this, this room is a treasure before God. God, your heart is so valuable to God. God wants your heart, all of it. He wants you to love him. Confession. If you are afraid of confessing your faith in Christ before men, can I tell you this morning, stop it. T tell people who you really are. Don't, don't keep it a secret. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before the angels of God. There may be somebody in your life that you've been mum around that you need to just tell them, hey, I want to tell you who I really am. I, I, am, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. And then finally, the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you and you have not been listening, stop. Stop not listening to the Holy Spirit. Open your heart, your ears to the truth and obey. There may be some here this morning that have been hearing the voice of the Spirit say to you, come to Jesus. Salvation is yours. Forgiveness is free. Heaven is free. There is a new life that is free to you. Just come to me. And I'll give you the strength. You don't have the strength to be honest. I'll give you the strength to be honest. I'll give you the strength to overcome fear. I'll, I'll give you the, the, the strength to, to live by true values and the strength to confess me before men. I know you can't do it on your own, but I'll give that to you if you will come to me. So here's my point. Stop not listening to God. And listen to him, because if you don't stop not listening to God, there may be a time when you can't. Amen. Let's pray.